great to see you all, and thanks for coming back. We are continuing our journey through the uh, New Testament, and tonight we're going to look at James, Hebrews, and Philemon. The other way around, though, Philemon, then Hebrews, and then the book of James. But I want to share with you a few thoughts from the book of Hebrews. And it starts by saying in chapter 1, verse 1, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. After He had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. There are some striking similarities, as one can probably expect, between Hebrews, the Gospel of John, and several of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. And as we will see a little bit later on, uh, we do not actually know who wrote the book to the Hebrews or the letter. You can call it a letter or a book. We'll talk about that uh, sometime later this evening. But there are some similarities. And you cannot read this introduction to the book of Hebrews without being struck by the fact that Jesus is held in high regard, that it's actually ultimately about Jesus Christ. Interesting to note <clears throat> that in the city of Antioch in Syria, the, the followers of Jesus first were called Christians by the name Christ, followers of Christ. And we cannot study the New Testament and we cannot even call ourselves people who belong to the church of Jesus Christ without thinking about that concept of Jesus or the person of Jesus and the concept of belonging to Him and holding Jesus in high regard. In fact, anybody who bears the name Christian should be a reflection of Christ, Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. The word really means Messiah or the Anointed One, the One who was sent by God. And as the author to the Hebrews points out over here, and as he starts his letter, or this document, maybe one should call it a document. He is at pains to point out that Jesus is central in everything and anything that we believe. In fact, you fiddle with that, and there's no reason to call yourself a Christian anymore. I, I have uh, always wondered how people can call themselves by this name, Christian or followers of Christ, and they don't hold Jesus in high regard. Because Everything that we are, our very being, uh, starts with Jesus Christ and who He is. And so the author points out several different things. In the past, God spoke in many different ways. And obviously through prophets and sometimes miracles and giving the law and many other things, as we will see um, in the rest of the book. And if you read the rest of the book, you'll find him highlighting many things in the Old Testament, ways in which God dealt with His people in the Old Testament. But then he says, in these last days, God spoke through his son, Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. And, and there is some, um, uh, some correspondence with, with John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And, and, and ultimately, the, the Word was God. And then this Word became a human being, became flesh, and dwelt with us. So God spoke in many different ways. He continues to speak in many ways. And... and if you hang around for the fourth module, we'll be looking at uh, the way that God reveals Himself. Uh, and one of the ways in which God does reveal Himself is through nature. Um, you, you observe and you see and you experience something of God. But ultimately, God chose to speak through Jesus Christ. And therefore, John calls Him the Word of God because God chose to speak to us, to reveal Himself through Jesus. The author goes on. And he says, he, is, he appointed the Son, His Son, Jesus, heir of all things. Uh, a very important concept in the ancient world. 
because the firstborn son, another concept that we find in John, uh, the firstborn son was the one who received everything. And it's not so much the fact that he was, was born or that he, um, that he was made. In fact, Jesus was not made or created. But the fact that he filled this kind of position of the firstborn and therefore he inherited everything from God. He appointed him heir over all things and through whom he made the universe. Another way in which this uh, letter or this document corresponds with John. Go back to John and very clearly in that first introduction of John and that prologue of John, you find a similar concept. Everything that we see, everything that exists was made by and through Jesus Christ. And, And here you have the same thought. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. Here it it goes to uh, several things that Paul says about Jesus in the book of Colossians in in particular, uh, that Jesus is the image of God. Um, Call it this spitting image to use a more modern term if you wish. But if you want to see God, uh, and this is what Jesus said to Thomas when Thomas asked him, show us the Father. He said, I've been with you. you. You observe me. You see me. And so I am the image of God. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His being, and sustaining everything through His powerful Word. It is Jesus who sustains the universe, who sustains us. And then after He provided purification for sins, and it's a reference to the fact that He died, He shed His blood, and it's through Jesus that there is atonement. And that's a story that He will pick up again and again and again in this book where He makes the comparison between uh, Jesus and who He is and the priests and the tabernacle and the temple worship in the Old Testament era and how Jesus has come to fulfill uh, all of that. And then He then sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven again, it's not so much the physical right-hand side of God, but it is really the preeminence of Jesus. His position is that of being in the most important place in the whole of the universe. You can't get closer to the best position or the biggest position than being at the right hand of God. And so he became much, as much superior to the angels as the name that he has inherited is superior to theirs. The concept of a name, once again, is an important one in the ancient world. It has to do with character. Uh, Your name really displays your character, which is why New Testament believers were baptized in the name of Jesus. It is the character. You you inherit the character of Jesus. You, You adopt the character of Jesus. He gives it to you through the Holy Spirit. And in this particular case, Jesus received that name, a name which is a reflection of His ultimate glory, Um, name here more than just the name Jesus. Uh, It is a reflection of who Jesus Christ is. And and just in these few verses, as the author author of the Hebrews introduces his book, uh, this document to us, he is highlighting, he's lifting Jesus up to a position where you you cannot but doubt, uh, you cannot but accept, rather, you cannot doubt the position of Jesus. You cannot but accept that Jesus is really the glory of God the Father. He's the reason that we are here. He's the reason that we are studying the Bible. Um, and my encouragement to you is, as much as we learn um, academically, perhaps, uh, information, accept information about the Bible, ultimately this book that I have in my hand is about introducing us to Jesus. And we need to be followers of Jesus. We need to learn more about Jesus. In any marriage, uh, we learn more and more and more about one another as time goes on. And, and that is my personal desire for myself, but also for you, is that through our study together, we will get to know Jesus, who He is, and that our knowledge of Him will increase, knowledge that will sink into, uh, into our hearts and into our lives that will affect the way that we live on a daily basis. So let's pray together before we get into the lecture time. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus into this world. Thank you that you have spoken in many different ways, that you have revealed yourself in many different ways, but ultimately you have revealed yourself through Jesus, the living word. Um, we, have, we have your written word, the Bible, to tell us more, uh, 
to tell us about yourself, to tell us about Jesus. And we thank you for an opportunity to go through the New Testament together, to be on this journey where we get to know not only the Bible, but ultimately getting to know you as our Father and Jesus as our Savior. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon us tonight as we continue our journey through the New Testament and learn more about the letters and books written and that have been taken up into uh, the Bible, into the canon of the New Testament. So bless us tonight, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do a bit of revision. The New Testament so far, where we've been coming from, we, we look at the intertestamental period as preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. And that's where the New Testament kicks in with the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, is, uh, um, the way that he lived in, in uh, Palestine at that particular time, uh, all the way to his death, resurrection, and ascension. Those things are described in the three synoptic Gospels and then also in the Gospel of John. We then took a, a journey with the Acts of the Apostles, uh, or through the Acts of the Apostles, looking at how the early church was established, taking us all the way to the death, um, not the death, but the, the imprisonment of Paul uh, in Acts chapter 28 in Rome. Um, last week we saw that Paul was likely to have been released from prison, traveled a little bit more, maybe a couple of years, two, three years, and it was during that time that he wrote the pastoral epistles, and he was then, according to church tradition, once again uh, either arrested or he ended up in Rome where he was arrested and he was executed by Nero around 66 or 67 uh, AD. We have looked at, he, at the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul and up to this point in time in terms of the letters of the New Testament, we've only looked at uh, all of those letters that we believe Paul wrote um, and we started with Romans and then the two letters to the Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, um, the last three of those written from prison, we call them the prison letters, and then first and, first and second Thessalonians, probably the first of the letters that Paul wrote, at least the ones we have on record, and then we have looked at the pastoral epistles, the two to Timothy and the one to Titus. In terms of the earliest letters of Paul, probably Thessalonians, first Thessalonians, the last letter that we have on record uh, of the Apostle Paul would be that of 2 Timothy. Uh, it's very clear from the book that he was expecting uh, to leave this life pretty soon after he wrote that letter, and that is what early church tradition also confirms. Now tonight we're going to take a look at the very last of the letters of the Apostle Paul, uh, not the last one that he wrote, but the last one that is in our canon, uh, and then we will start our journey tonight and next week looking at the general epistles, and uh, I'll introduce those topics to you as we go along. And we, tonight we're going to look at Hebrews and James. Required reading, um, as I always do, I encourage you to read further, to start with the Bible. I think that's a good place to start. But then also to study anything and everything related to those letters. And uh, in, in the context of tonight's le um, lesson or lecture, whether you look at Philemon, Onesimus, uh, slavery in the New Testament, which we will be looking at, and you may want to do a bit of a study on that particular topic. Then the book of Hebrews, covenant, the concept of covenant is extremely strong in the book of Hebrews. Uh, and then the Old Testament sacrificial system, the temple, the tabernacle, and all those things, priestly systems, and so on. Uh, the book of James, we also find in James some wisdom literature um, or wisdom genre and uh, that's another thing that you can maybe look up, uh, look at uh, as you look up some of these uh, concepts in your additional reading. Brings us to the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon. I call it just a personal letter. There are many other ways of summarizing the letter, um, I guess. Uh, Paul to Philemon. Uh, the heart of this letter is about Onesimus, who is a slave who fled and became a Christian, and uh, Paul is sending him back to his owner. In terms of the writing of Philemon, there is very, very little doubt that Paul wrote it. The letter to Philemon is uh, actually a little gem. It only has one chapter, so whenever I refer to the letter, it will only be by verses. Uh, there is only one chapter. In fact, we don't refer to the chapter. Um, but it does allow us to experience Paul on a slightly more personal level. 
Uh, we've had a little bit of a glimpse into his life and his relationships with other people, and more specifically his co-workers Timothy and Titus when uh, we looked at the pastoral epistles. But here we have a little letter that slipped in, as it were, which was not written to a church. It wasn't written to a pastor. It's actually a very personal uh, issue that Paul is addressing uh, with Philemon. Philemon um, seems to have been a personal convert, a, a friend of Paul, or maybe at least while he was, let's say, in Ephesus at the time, and we've looked at that uh, when he was in Asia Minor, uh, because Philemon lived in Colossae, the city of Colossae, and um, it was during that time, or maybe at another time, maybe on a visit to Ephesians, to Ephesus, or, or whatever, uh, that, that Paul was able to lead uh, Philemon to the Lord, or one of his co-workers did so, but uh, certainly Paul regards him as a friend. And then Onesimus uh, became a Christian under Paul's ministry, it seems like. And um, uh, Paul then had to make a very, very hard decision in terms of what he is, uh, was going to do uh, with Onesimus. When you look at the map over here, uh, just to remind you, this is Asia Minor, the whole uh, area of Asia Minor with Miletus and then Ephesus uh, just uh, north of there. And then all those cities and the stars on this map represent the seven letters in the book of Revelation. And uh, to remind you that Colossae uh, was just south of Laodicea. And uh, we have looked at this kind of map, or we've looked at maps when we, uh, when we studied the letter to the Colossians. And the conditions and the background to uh, Philemon, the letter to Philemon and that of Colossians, actually look very similar. Some of the same names occur. And um, so we, we think that it was the, more or less the same time. In fact, it may have been the exact same time that Paul wrote to the Colossians and used the opportunity of also sending a letter to the man called Philemon. There are some personal names in common. Uh, when you go to the beginning of Philemon, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend, and so on. Later on in verse 23, he talks about Epaphras, our fellow prisoner, for Christ, and then there's Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, uh, several names that he mentions over here. When you look at the conditions of that and you look at, at uh, Colossians, for example, it starts virtually, um, the, not the same, but uh, it, it, there are similarities. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. As you go through the book of Colossians, uh, and we'll look at a couple of the, ver those verses later on, you'll find that there are similarities in the names and the circumstances uh, which gives us the idea that Paul sent these two letters simultaneously. And so one can regard him as part of the, this one as part of the prison letters, and therefore, similar time, we're talking about Paul's first imprisonment, so roughly 62, 3, or 4, 64 perhaps, when Paul was writing this, uh, maybe 65, and uh, Paul sent the letter to Colossians with Tychicus. And uh, when you go to Colossians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus. And there is the strong uh, indication that we're talking about the exact same time, at least. I'm sending him with Onesimus, and, and here Paul's testimony about Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. Uh, in other words, he's talking to the Colossian church and is already commending Onesimus uh, to the church and saying he is actually one of you, uh, and I'm going to send him, well, he doesn't say so in, uh, in, in Colossians. He's not addressing the issue of sending Onesimus back or the issue behind that. He's simply saying, I'm sending him back. Uh, but the two of them, Tychicus and Onesimus, and perhaps there were others, um, they are coming uh, to Colossians or to the city of Colossae. When we look at a, a brief outline, in fact, it is a very brief book. It only has 25 verses. There are introductions. Uh, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. 
Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Very typical letter writing style back in the first century as Paul introduces his letter. Then he starts as, again, very typical of a personal letter. You would, you would start with some kind of positive comment, uh, uh, commenting on your friend or the person you're writing to or uh, commending him or her for something. And this is what he says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your, your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Quite a, a compliment here to Philemon when Paul writes to him. Starting with verse 8 all the way to verse 21, the issue then shifts to the main topic of the letter, and that is Onesimus. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, there's the prison background, it seems like, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. So the context seems very clear that uh, while Paul was in prison, he met Onesimus, and Onesimus became a Christian, or at least made a decision to follow Christ. And uh, so that, that provides us a little bit of the background to the writing of this letter. And then Paul goes on, and we'll discuss that uh, in just a moment. In verse 22, the issue of Onesimus is now all finished. Um, and then he says, And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Uh, as we have already said, Paul was in prison, first imprisonment. He was expecting to be released, which is different when you read 2 Timothy. He seems to be um, uh, sort of almost resigned to the fact that he was going to die pretty soon, but not over here. He even asks um, Philemon to prepare a room for him because he's hoping to come and visit him at some point in time. And then there are final greetings, and we've read uh, some of that Epaphras. Uh, my fellow prisoner for Christ Jesus sends you greetings, and so do Mark and Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit. When it comes to Philemon, um, the background to Philemon or who the man was, uh, he may have been a wealthy member of the Colossian church. And so when Paul wrote the, the letter to the Colossians, uh, uh, Philemon probably was in the audience. In fact, some believe that he may have been a leader or the leader even of the church at uh, Colossians. We, we don't know that for certain. But the reality is when you read the story in Philemon at least, uh, that Philemon was a wealthy man, probably well-to-do. He at least had one slave, Onesimus. He probably had more. Uh, but again, that uh, deduction we can't necessarily make. He had a house big enough to accommodate a church. Paul says in verse 2, greet the church that meets in your house. So this is not just a small little pondoki somewhere. It must have been a bigger place where at least you can fit in 20, 30, or 100 people or more. And then there was a guest room. Not all people in the ancient world, in fact, not all people in our world, uh, have space for a guest. Uh, some people can barely fit in the, the, the family members in, their, in, the, in the rooms that they have in the house, and some have more than one family. So to even have a separate room where you can put up a guest means that you are certainly in a wealthier uh, sort of strata of the society. And so that, that's Philemon. As I said earlier on, he probably became a Christian under Paul's ministry. Paul says in verse 19, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand, I will, pay, I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Now, again, Paul doesn't say, I led you to Christ. But when Paul makes an appeal for Philemon, to Philemon, to receive Onesimus back, now as a Christian and a fellow a, a brother in Christ, uh, Paul is appealing to the fact that he, Paul, had some kind of influence in the life of Philemon. Probably led him to Christ, and therefore, in a certain sense, uh, Philemon owed his life to the Apostle Paul. And Paul must have had a very good relationship with him uh, because he now takes the liberty, the freedom, to write to Philemon and to make some, um, albeit uh, between the lines, recommendations uh, 
but he is definitely trusting Philemon to treat Onesimus, his runaway slave, in a proper manner. When it comes to the man Onesimus, we actually have zero idea, no idea, where he came from. Uh, we'll look at slavery in general in just a moment, but the reality was that Onesimus was a slave who belonged to Philemon. Um, somehow he managed to escape, uh, which was not an uncommon thing uh, in those days. Uh, it wasn't as if they were living in prisons, most of them. Uh, and uh, so somehow he escaped and he ended up in Rome where he made contact with the Apostle Paul. Uh, how that contact was made, we also don't know. Whether Onesimus simply by chance happened upon the Apostle Paul, we don't know. I personally have a suspicion, uh, and I, I, can't, I can't prove this, but that, that he knew the Apostle Paul from the contact that Paul had with the household of Philemon, somehow or the other. Uh, that would not have been a very strange thing, because Paul may have been in the house of Philemon, or, or Onesimus may have traveled with Philemon to, let's say, Ephesus, where Paul was, and so he would have known him. So knowing that Paul was in Rome, he looked him up, and he told him what has happened, and then he started serving the Apostle Paul. But how the two of them met in Rome uh, or in prison, that is not told to us. Interesting is that the name Onesimus means useful, and it provides Paul, that is in the Greek, it provides Paul with a wonderful way of playing on words. And in verse 11, he says, I, verse 10, he says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. And he's playing on the word Onesimus over, over here. And in other words, he's now actually coming, coming into his own. His name is now really becoming really prophetic, if you wish. Uh, that's the name he always had, um, but, but of course now he really becomes useful uh, to you and me. So it's a beautiful little gem uh, as we look at this uh, particular letter. Now what was Paul's dilemma? Paul was sitting with the issue of slavery. Philemon was a Christian. Now Philemon was a friend of Paul. So there was obviously a good relationship. But then Onesimus, a runaway slave, uh, somehow makes contact with Paul or the two of them get in touch with one another and Paul probably led him to the Lord. Now Onesimus is a Christian. And from a purely theological, biblical, Christian view, the two are now brothers. The owner and the slave, they are brothers. And uh, Onesimus has become very dear to the Apostle Paul, as we have seen both in Colossians as well as in, in this reference in verse 12. And so Paul's dilemma is, does he send him back? He is a runaway slave. You, you cannot change that fact. And his status as a runaway slave has not changed when he became a Christian. Now, oftentimes, I guess we have those same issues when we think about people who may serve a prison sentence or may even be um, getting the death sentence, uh, not, no longer in our country, but in other countries. Uh, they go to prison, and in the time that they serve in prison, or that they wait for the death penalty or whatever, they become Christian. Now, of course, from a Christian perspective, your very first question is, uh, are they not supposed to be forgiven and to be set free? And um, I guess that is one's gut feel and gut reaction, now that the person is, and I'm talking about a person who is genuinely becoming a Christian and not just uh, in, in name or trying to uh, play the fool or something, or, or to, to beg for some kind of release or relief. Um, and, and Paul was facing a similar challenge. He now has this slave. He's actually very useful to the Apostle Paul. He happens to be a fellow Christian brother now, but Philemon is still in the background as the owner of this man, of Onesimus. And so Paul obviously had to make a decision, do I send him back or do I keep him and how do I handle this? And I believe that, that Paul did was what was right and also what was wise under the circumstances. And that is he sent the slave back, not knowing how Philemon was going to handle this. Hence the letter to prepare Philemon um, to, so that Philemon would know 
what has now happened to Onesimus. Onesimus could have vanished in thin air. He could have uh, skipped the Mediterranean and go to Egypt, for that matter, if he wanted to, or North Africa. Um, but it seems like Onesimus also now know that the right thing to do is to go back to his owner, he's now a Christian, to ask for forgiveness, and then to pick up the relationship from there. Uh, Paul, on the other hand, is making an appeal to Philemon, the owner, to really take him to receive him back, now not as a runaway anymore, but now as a, as a Christian brother, but still a slave. So it's a very interesting dilemma when you really look at, at the situation. The issues in Philemon, we can raise many of those. We need to read the letter against the background of the social order of the New Testament times. Slavery was an accepted reality at that time. It was simply part of the social order in the first century, whether we like it or not. In fact, the reality is that for centuries after that, it remained part of the social environment um, around the world, um, Europe and in America and all over the place. Christians were not miraculously removed from the society and the social order of the day. We were, and, and we still are not, simply suddenly taken from this world into a heavenly realm, and there we are, and things are now hon honky-dory. We, we face the social realities of our day. They may be bad, they may be unchristian, they may be non-Christian or unbiblical. The reality is that is where we live. And that is where the first century Christians lived in those days. Paul's understanding of the implications of the gospel, um, that there is freedom in Christ, and that we are equal before Christ, something he mentions in the book of Galatians, there is no longer slave and owner. There is no longer male, female. We're all equal before Christ. Uh, he says in terms of our status before God, there is no difference. But the reality is God did not change male and female, into something that is neutral. And we, now that we're Christian, there are no more women and men. And similarly, in the first century in particular, and for, as I said before, several, many centuries after that, uh, the reality is that Christians, the church, did not come to this full realization that slavery is wrong and evil, something that you and I would probably fight for today. But it wasn't necessarily the case back in the first century. And so the way that Paul treats uh, Onesimus and Philemon and this issue is actually quite significant when you come to think of it. Um, when you look at slavery and the Bible in general, uh, going back into the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, it is interesting to note that slavery is never condemned per se. Never. There is no place in the Bible where it says you must not and you cannot have a slave. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, it never tells uh, either the Israelites or the Christians, you must go and buy slaves and it's okay to have slaves. It doesn't say that. But in the Old Testament, it seems like God, through Moses, recognized the fact that slavery is a reality and therefore that it needs to be regulated so that Israel would stand out as being different from the nations around. So instead of saying, you cannot have slaves, God is saying to them, here are the rules and the regulations in order to treat your slaves in a humane and in a godly way. So the rules are laid down for the way that Israel was supposed to, they didn't always do it, but the way they were supposed to treat their slaves. It didn't take slavery away. And a similar thing happens in the New Testament. We have several passages in the New Testament where there are regulations and rules, not, not the rules given as to exactly how you should treat every or how uh, the conditions you should create for your slave uh, or how a slave should treat an owner. But there are clear directives as to how a Christian should have a different attitude than the rest of um, the, the human world. So both Jesus and the New Testament authors simply accept the fact that there, there is um, a status quo that will be maintained for probably a long while uh, after that. And they used slavery in illustrations. Uh, and we read in scriptures how um, regulations are given so that both uh, the uh, Israelites in the Old Testament and Christians in the New Testament should have a different attitude towards this social reality. 
Again, I want to reiterate, it was a social reality back in those days, and they simply accepted that. The difficulty for us today, and it's a hermeneutical one, uh, hermeneutic, the word hermeneutics, some of you may recall, means how we interpret the Bible. And the way we interpret the Bible, uh, we need to be very careful that we don't read the Bible with our modern eyes or glasses only. We need to first of all put ourselves in the situation of a first century reader of the scriptures and then read it from that perspective to try and find out what it is saying. Then we need to take the principles and the guidelines of scripture and say, how do they apply to us today? And of course today, um, most Christians around the world, I, I don't know any Christian around the world who would still argue that we should have slaves or um, that we should uh, offer ourselves to become slaves or whatever the case might be. Some of the historical facts on slavery, and, and um, you may do your own research in this regard, um, but there are many wild statements when it comes to slavery. Some people say two-thirds of the ancient world, the first century world, was enslaved, and others say no, it was 50%, and others say no, it was much lower than that, and um, so it's, it's not always easy to know. It's not as if we have facts and numbers given to us by uh, literature or, or material information that comes from um, that particular era. Scholars are not in full agreement as to exactly what the situation was. But there are different descriptions on the number, the percentage of slaves in the ancient society, and then how, how slaves were treated. Some, some people, some scholars, have a blanket statement by saying, Slaves were uh, mistreated by all of their owners, full stop. Now, that is also not exactly true. Not if you read the Old Testament, at least. It seems like God laid down the rules very clearly for slaves to be treated in a humane way. They were still slaves, but God provided them with rules and regulations so that they would be different from the nations around. And uh, Paul and others provide uh, the the context in the New Testament where, where you now have both Christian owners and Christian slaves, and it, it, it gives some directives how these people should uh, operate with one another. Onesimus, Philemon, their relationship is but one of the examples we have uh, in the New Testament. When we approach the historical information uh, about slavery, one, one really needs to be cautious uh, how you uh, receive that information. If you type this into the internet, you're going to find millions of different sites providing all sorts of information about slavery uh, in the New Testament era. And um, I'm just asking you to be uh, cautious when you, when you weigh up the information uh, that you receive. But there are a few things that we, that we can say about slavery, and that is that a sizable part of the ancient society was enslaved. How many? How far it stretched, we, we actually don't know for certain. But there was a sizable community, uh, both in the Old Testament world, right into the New Testament era um, of the community or society that was enslaved. The position of slaves in, in a household literally depended on the household, on the owner and, um, and, and how they treated them. Some slaves, and the Old Testament actually makes provision for that, where an owner, an Israelite owner, would have a slave, and only for a duration of time. That was one of the regulations in the Old Testament. You couldn't have a slave forever. But at a particular time, the slave needs to be set free. Then it was the slave's choice whether the slave would like to stay on. And if so, then the slave would become the permanent property of that particular owner, which was quite an interesting way of dealing with it. Now, the, the reason why I mention that is I read into that the fact that God knew that some, in fact, He wanted His, uh, his people, those who are owners of slaves, to treat their slaves in such a way that they provided a safe and a good environment for those slaves where they can work and where they can uh, even get to know God and where they would come at the end and they are now set free and they opt, they choose to actually stay with the owner, meaning that they have a good life and they choose to have this life rather than a life elsewhere, which may be a lot worse than working for and living in the home or in the household of this particular owner. Now, today, we would have the exact same thing. Uh, if we have a bit of a survey right here, you'll find 
uh, people working for a particular boss and they hate the boss because it's just bad, bad conditions and I, I would get out of there as soon as I possibly can. Um, there are others who love it. They, uh, they would go to work uh, more than they're supposed to go to work um, and, and, and um, that situation still endures till today. Now, the other reality is that slaves were at the bottom of the social rank uh, back in those days. You, you couldn't get lower than a slave. You, you lost your right to vote, uh, to own stuff. Uh, you actually were owned by your owner, uh, and, and there were very, very little human rights. Uh, the word human rights or the concept human rights did not exist uh, in those days. And it is true that many, many, many owners uh, mistreated their slaves in a terrible way, which is, again, as I reminded you, uh, why God in the Old Testament and, and also Paul and others in the New Testament provided directives to Christian owners as to how they need to trade, uh, how they need to um, treat their slaves. New Testament authors following the Old Testament guidelines sought to provide humane and acceptable conditions for and the, uh, for the slaves and the treatment of slaves as well. When we get to the New Testament and it comes to slavery, many slaves were undoubtedly mistreated, but there were many exceptions to the rule. And um, obviously when a person now becomes a Christian, immediately you need to look at life differently. The, you have a new orientation, you have a new heart. Uh, if you are, even in our modern day and time, if you're the owner of a business or you're a manager in a, in a managerial position, um, and you have mistreated your people, now suddenly you become a Christian, uh, God is expecting you, the New Testament expects you, God, Jesus expects you to change your heart, your, your style, the way you treat people, and whether it's your family, your friends, or those who work with you or under you, obviously it must, be, uh, it, it must change. Now, it is also true that back in both the Old Testament times all the way into the Christian era, that slavery often provided a solution for poverty and misfortune for many people uh, in those societies. We find it back in the Old Testament where uh, as much as God did not want that to happen, that some Israelites actually get to a, got to a point where they were so poor that they literally sold themselves to fellow Israelites. Now, that was an unacceptable practice, but it, it gives you some glimpse into the society of the time where people became so poor and poverty-stricken that it was better for them to sell themselves to an owner where at least they had food and some conditions where they could work and earn an income. This is not even uh, remotely an argument for slavery, but it is the reality, uh, just as we sometimes talk about multiple wives, for example. Uh, in, in some cases, and it was never God's initial ideal, but in some cases it provided in the needs of women, uh, of whom there were more than men. And so most women couldn't find a man or a husband. And therefore, in some cases, um, you could say polygamy provided in the needs of some women. And it's, it's a, it would be like a missionary going into a particular country where polygamy is practiced um, right now, and a person, the husband, becomes a, a Christian. And uh, you then tell him, well, you now need to get rid of, of five of your six wives. And suddenly, it has actually literally happened in, in, his, in the history of missions or missionary work. And suddenly, five women were sitting on the street. They had no income. Uh, they were dependent on the husbands. And now suddenly, the husband is a Christian and he let the wives go. So obviously, from a missions perspective, one would go in and say, as you go on, the next generation, don't, at least don't marry another one. But look after the six that you do have, and then in the next generation of Christians, uh, you would only uh, want those people to have one wife rather than multiple wives and so on. And a similar thing would happen over here. If you just came in and Paul and others would come in and say, slavery is out, uh, you would upset the society and the balance in society to such an extent that it would almost be impossible for some of those people to survive. A runaway slave is another reality that I need to mention. Uh, could, if caught, uh, was in danger of not only grave punishment sometimes, but the owner could literally take that, that slave's uh, life. And um, so Onesimus uh, was, was risking f fleeing from his owner, 
And Paul was risking sending him back to his owner. And again, that's why Paul wrote the letter, to prepare Philemon for what was going to happen with the return of Onesimus. Some of the passages that I want to mention, Colossians chapter 3, 22, and Ephesians chapter 6, and also 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. In fact, let me just turn back to Timothy, and uh, you'll find some guidelines. He says, all who are under the yoke of slavery, and Paul is not talking about sin, he's talking about physical slavery, should consider their masters worthy of full respect. Paul is not saying, run away, you're now a Christian, you shouldn't be a slave. He's saying, as a slave and a Christian now, you need to treat your master in a Christian manner, with full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them, because they are brothers. Now, here is a recognition of the situation that Paul is addressing in Philemon. Philemon is a Christian, Onesimus became a Christian. Does it change their social standing? Uh, does it change the fact that Philemon is an owner and Onesimus is a slave? No, it doesn't. Does it change their status before God? Yes, it does. They are brothers in Christ. And that's exactly what Paul is saying to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. These are the things you are to teach and urge on them, uh, or on them. Now, when you go back to Colossians, uh, it's interesting, it's the same destination of, for the letters. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, Paul has just talked about wives and all sorts of um, other re regulations for family, children, husbands, and so on, fathers. And then he expands, on, he, he only has a couple of verses on, on wives and husbands, children, and fathers. And then he says in verse 22, slaves, uh, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong and there is no favoritism. But then Paul goes on, as he does in Ephesians, and I'm not going to go to Ephesians now, but in chapter 4, verse 1 of Colossians, he says, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Different perspective. So you're not just a master of this slave. You must know you are a slave, because you now have a master in heaven. You have Jesus over you. And Jesus, or God, over you uh, is determining how you will treat others under you. And so the over and under situation has not changed. What has changed is the fact that both uh, the slave and the master recognize God, or Jesus, as their Savior and their Lord. Coming back to Paul and Philemon, Paul writes to intercede for Onesimus. Uh, Paul's commendation we looked at earlier on. Uh, it's quite um, uh, positive and encouraging. Um, probably, if you wish, softening him up a little bit uh, would, be, would be my assessment of it uh, and saying establishing the, the foundation upon which he's going to make an appeal uh, that he receives Onesimus back. And then Paul's very subtle appeal to Philemon to treat Onesimus in a proper Christian way is very, very challenging. Verse 8, and nine we've read before, uh, he goes on, he says, I'm sending him to you who is my very heart. And Paul very subtly is saying to Philemon, the way you treat Onesimus, you're touching my heart. I want you to know it. So Paul is very clear in his relationship with Philemon. We are brothers. I respect you. You respect me. Now, I want you to treat my friend and my brother Onesimus in a different way. I would have liked to, to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I didn't, want, I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. In other words, Paul gives a, a, a new spin on the whole thing. Perhaps Onesimus needed to run away. 
because that brought him in, in contact with me. That made him a Christian. Now, Philemon, you're going to receive him back. He's no longer just a slave. You're now receiving a brother. And so maybe it was good for him to be separated from you for a, a little while. Um, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man, in other words, as a slave, and as a brother in the Lord. Uh, interesting perspective. So, says Paul, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. In other words, the way you treat him is the way you treat me. If he has done anything, if he has done you any wrong, or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. That's his signature. Uh, I will pay back. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. And just listen to this very subtle appeal. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Is Paul asking Philemon to set Onesimus free? He doesn't say so directly because Paul acknowledges and he recognizes the social order of his day. And he is not going to go on a rampage marching uh, to try and change the social order. That seems to be somehow for many, many years later when it was needed. But in Paul's day, it was still too early to actually address that particular social order. What Paul does say to Philemon, I want you to treat him in a humane, Christian manner. And that makes all the difference in the world. And then just perhaps between the lines, he is he's perhaps asking Philemon, go one step beyond what I'm asking you. This is what I ask you. But perhaps, Philemon, you will do more than I'm actually asking you to do. Now what is interesting is that there may be an archaeological link with Philemon. And this is what we find in BibleLandHistory.com. An inscription erected by a freed slave from Laodicea was dedicated to Marcus Cestius Philemon. It will be recalled that a Philemon who owned the slave Onesimus was a leader in the church of Colossae. We cannot identify this Philemon with the slaveholder to whom Paul wrote. But the coincidence of the inscription from the same area, just north of Colossae, um, is, is intriguing, especially since it refers to the manumission, the freeing of a slave. So a slave is acknowledging that his owner uh, had let him go. And um, the, it happens to be Philemon who let a slave go. Now, is it the same Philemon? We cannot say for certain. Uh, but as this particular website says, uh, it is uh, maybe not just uh, a, a matter of coincidence. There's more historical information. Uh, and, and again, whether the link is there with this Philemon and Onesimus, we don't know. But Ignatius of Antioch in, this, in the early 2nd century AD mentioned an Onesimus who was the bishop of Ephesus. And although it's doubted by some authorities, it may well be that this Onesimus was the same one consecrated a bishop by the apostles and accepted the episcopal throne in Ephesus following the apostle Timothy. Um, and that's what this particular website, this is Wikipedia, what it says. And again, this is now even more remote, um, but it is the same general area, and so it may not be impossible to have the same Onesimus arrive back home. Uh, we don't know the follow-up of the story in the Bible or from the Bible, but he may have arrived home, and uh, after all the necessary things happened and, um, and whatnot, um, Philemon may have let him free. Um, this same Onesimus may have ended up in, in Laodicea, and later on, uh, as, he, as he wandered in Christian circles, became well known and may have ended up a bishop or a leader of a church. Again, we can't say that for certain. When it comes to the message and the contents of Philemon, the letter gives us some insight into social issues faced by the early church. We find it in James. We'll, we'll actually pick it up in James. In James, it's more poor people as opposed to rich people 
Um, and certainly the owners in those days would represent the rich people and the poor people would be represented by the slaves or the slaves would have been seen as the poor ones. And it was an issue in the church, not only Gentile Jew, but also social levels, uh, how to integrate them into one society. We should not downplay the importance of this letter or see it as irrelevant because we no longer support slavery. Uh, as I said, the Bible never says slavery as such is wrong. But it does give an indication, as the church later started realizing, many, many years later, uh, that we cannot, we cannot fight for slavery based on the principles that we find in the Scriptures. And none of us, uh, I guess, here tonight would want to bring that back in. Application and challenge. How do we treat people of a different order, st stratum in society? than ours in our homes and uh, many of us have them in our homes and whether it is your boss or someone working for you how do we treat people in a different social stratum um, and for us as Christians that is a, a real challenge does Christianity seek to change an evil s social order or society uh, from without in other words do we go on a march and try and change the structures the the outward structures or do we preach the gospel change the hearts, and then help those people when they have changed hearts to address the social order of the day. Not an easy question, because it's not, it's not a one single answer to that particular question, I believe. There are times when I believe Christians really need to stand up and address the social um, evils of their day and, uh, and do it directly, such as the issue of slavery many years later. But there are times when it probably will be better to address the heart of the person or persons or people and, and then as their hearts change to believe that out of that social order will change. And then in which way can one use Philemon to give us guidance on issues that we are facing today, the HIV, uh, AIDS, poverty, human rights and many other issues that we are facing in our day and time. Now before we get to the general letters, we're going to take a break and have some tea. So welcome back. After that uh, one hour talk about Philemon and slavery and the social issues of the first century, we are leaving the Apostle Paul and we're going to look at the general epistles. And these are mostly letters to unidentified audiences or receivers of those letters. And um, that's one of the reasons why we call them general. Uh, eight of the New Testament letters are called or identified, classified as general epistles. Since they do not address a particular audience, they're not written to a particular person, uh, with, with a couple of exceptions, but, and even if they are, um, it's like the Theophilus of Luke, uh, whom we cannot really identify. Uh, that's very different from the letters that Paul wrote. Uh, it's written to Colossians, to Ephesians, or to the Romans, or to an individual, and we can identify those uh, individuals. That is not the case with the general epistles. The, the nature of, of the, the epistles not having a particular audience, and in some cases, such as the book of Hebrews, which we will look at in a moment, uh, with, with an unidentified author, uh, makes it very difficult for us to provide more of the background. It was, it's wonderful with the letters of Paul, because you can plot them on a timeline. You can say he was here and he wrote there, and uh, this was the time he was in prison here. And so you have a bit of the background, the circumstances under which a letter was written. Uh, that is not the case with the general epistles. And uh, that's the other reason why they are called a general. And they were probably listed in our canon the way they are um, because they didn't fit with the Pauline corpus of letters. Um, and they are then also probably listed by length where Hebrews is the longest of the general epistles and therefore it occurs first in that whole uh, group, grouping of uh, letters. And so as we look at the book of Hebrews, um, in one word one can summarize it as the covenant or the new covenant about the covenant, the new covenant. It is the longest of the general epistles. As I said uh, earlier on, it has the reputation of being a difficult book. And oftentimes Christians or people avoid the book because they think it's too difficult. I, I, actually, when I read the book, um, there are some things that I cannot necessarily explain. Maybe some I couldn't explain in the past, especially. 
uh, but I, I don't see it as a very difficult book, really. Um, you, you talk about the book of Revelation, there are lots of symbolism, and it's difficult to understand exactly where the symbolism fit in and, and how you need to apply them, but not so with the book of Hebrews. Uh, it actually makes a, a comparison between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and how that imply, how, how, how that has implications for our, our lives as Christians and the way that we live on a daily basis. Now, because of the different nature of this book, Hebrews, and you will, you will see that immediately as you pick up the book, there is no introduction. It doesn't talk about the author. Uh, it doesn't talk about the recipients. Uh, there is almost no introduction. You have to really go right to the end to find any real personal comments. And those comments look like it could be written by someone like the Apostle Paul, for example, with some names and some uh, practical conditions described. But apart from that, um, the book doesn't read like a letter at all. Uh, and so some scholars refer to this as a sermonic epistle. In other words, it's almost like a sermon uh, where someone is preaching but actually writing it all down. And, and I would tend to agree uh, with that sort of identification of the book. The author of Hebrews is not known to us. And that's just the long and the short of it. Uh, there is no heading. There is not really an early church tradition that is reliable that you can say uh, they ascribe it to Paul or to this or to that or the other. Um, there are no good wishes and the normal introduction to the letter, those things are missing. Uh, and it feels very different. It, it sounds very different from anything that Paul wrote. So if you have been reading through the, the Pauline letters up to this point in time, and you get into the book of Hebrews, you will immediately see that it doesn't really look like one of Paul's letters. And although some people have claimed that Paul wrote it, and they have all sorts of arguments, in fact, books have been written about the authorship of Hebrews, uh, some people would say it's Luke uh, or an unknown disciple of Paul. Uh, some even claim that it may have been Apollos, uh, but, but really those are just uh, suggestions uh, and guesses because we literally just don't know who wrote this book. And so more often than not, you will hear a preacher say what I said earlier on, the author of the book of the Hebrews rather than Paul. Sometimes there's a bit of a slip of the tongue uh, because Paul is so well known as having written 13 of the letters in the New Testament that you have a slip of the tongue. You say, Paul says in Hebrews 6, verse 5, or whatever. Uh, but that's really a slip of the tongue because we really just don't know who wrote it. That also means that we don't know when it was written, such as is the case with most of the general epistles because the circumstances, the background, those things are not known to us. But Clement, the bishop of Rome, in 95 AD already knew about this particular book, which means that it was already written uh, in the first century for sure. There's no doubt about that. Um, and the many references to, in Hebrews to the worship practices in the temple um, may mean that it was written before 70 AD, uh, before Jerusalem fell uh, under the Romans. Uh, that is, again, not, you can't confirm that, but, but Hebrews especially... Uh, the book and the style and the references to the temple or the tabernacle worship. So on. there was ample opportunity for the author to say, uh, and, and just a few years ago, uh, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, and, and um, that sort of proves my point or whatever. But he never does that. It seems like he's assuming that the priesthood is still functioning, that they go, still go regularly with their offerings to uh, the, uh, in, uh, to the altar and so on. Although he refers to the tabernacle, which is the older version of the temple, of course, um, you, you can still sort of get the feeling that perhaps the temple worship was still going at that time, which then means it would have been written before 70 uh, AD. But there's just lack of concrete, evi concrete evidence, and we don't know. In terms of the recipients, again, it's that particular background that may give us an indication of the recipients. Where they were, we have no idea. But it looks like it may have been a Jewish audience. Uh, the, the author just assumes too much knowledge of the Old Testament that it would have been written to a totally non-Jewish audience or recipients. So my, again, my suspicion is 
that you're talking about some kind of a Jewish audience, perhaps even in Jerusalem or wherever, uh, but that, again, we cannot determine for certain. In terms of the purpose of Hebrews, maybe similar to that of Paul, addressing the, the, the issue of the place of the law in Christianity. What place does it really fulfill? And um, the author goes on a, on a long journey through the Old Testament, the Old Testament system, the sacrificial system, the priests, and everything else, to prove the point that Jesus superseded, that Jesus replaced it, that, that He fulfilled everything that was there in the Old Testament. He actually points out that what we have in the Old Testament era really is a shadow of what is in heaven. But now Jesus has come. He died. He died once for all, not continuously bringing sacrifices like the priest. He is our high priest. And He has gone into the place that is now the, the full version, the real version of what God really intended. And that is heaven. So God is in heaven. He's in the, uh, Jesus is in heaven. He is in the presence of God where He is bringing Himself and His own blood as a sacrifice. And He's done that once for all. And that's essentially what the author to the Hebrews is saying. We don't have to go to the Old Testament sacrificial system again. In that sense, there, there's uh, some uh, correspondence between uh, what Paul is saying, uh, but, but in a very, very different way, which means that I personally don't believe that Paul wrote this particular letter. He also, as a result of that whole argument, and that is that we are in Christ and that Jesus fulfilled the law. We no longer have to go into the temple or the tabernacle. We don't have to bring those sacrifices. Jesus fulfilled all of that. As a result of that, the, the second half of the letter, we'll, go, we'll look at the contents in a moment, but the second half of the letter is very encouraging. In fact, you find the encouragement throughout the whole letter. Every now and again, he stops and he says, and now let me challenge you on that, uh, and that is you need to really hold on. Um, like... He's just in chapter 1, he talks about who Jesus is. And, and I've read the first introductory verses. Then he makes a comparison between Jesus and the angels. And he says, Jesus is so much more than the angels. Uh, God never said to any of the angels, you are my son. Uh, today you have become my son or something like that. But he said it to Jesus. And so he proves how Jesus supersedes um, and is much more than the angels. And then he stops in chapter 2 verse 1. And remember, the chapter divisions were added later on. But he says, we must, pay careful, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? He said, he says, I've just proved to you that Jesus is so much more than the angels. Now, the word of the angels, or given via angels, was binding. How much more is the word of Jesus binding? Therefore, he says, we must pay much more attention. We must be much more careful to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. So, that sort of encouragement, those two things. One, proving who Jesus is, as a result of that, we need to live lives that prove that we follow Jesus Christ. So those two things you will find throughout the book of Hebrews, essentially. When it comes to an outline, in terms of the content of Hebrews, um, chapter 1 all the way to chapter 10, the first 10 chapters, really, we're talking about a, a comparison between the old and the new. And unless you know something about the old, and he does introduce that as well, he explains it even, but if you want more information, you go back to Leviticus and, and some parts of Exodus and Numbers and so on, and you read that, and it provides you with the old. This is the old covenant. This is the old law. This is the old sacrificial system. And he compares that with Jesus. And he says, Jesus is so much more than the angels. He is so much more than the prophets. And that's the way he started. We read that earlier on. In the old days, before God spoke through the prophets, now he spoke through Jesus. Then he is superior to the angels. It's only to Jesus that he said, you are my son. He never said that to the, any of the angels. Then he compares him with Moses. Now, Moses was an important man. Moses received the law. But Jesus is more important than Moses because Jesus brought God to us in human being. And then 
he is so much superior to Aaron and the priests. And uh, we don't have time to go into all of that, but there, there's a long section where he explains the priesthood and the sacrifices and the high priest and how he goes into the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, once a year and so on. And then he compares that and says, but Jesus came and he died and he not only did he, did he die, but he went into not a shadow, not a tabernacle, not the most holy place, which is only a shadow here on earth, but he went into the heavens and he's with the Father where he's interceding for us. So Jesus is so much more. He is our high priest. And therefore, we, can, we have free access to God through Jesus Christ. And it's, as I said, it's a long section but, but if you read it from this particular perspective, it really makes a lot of sense looking at the comparison between what was in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant and how Jesus came to supersede that in the New Testament. Here and then he goes on to encourage his uh, readers, the recipients, to persevere. As I said before, he's done that already on several occasions in those passages. He comes and he talks to them about perseverance and, and standing fast for God. But, but now he shifts and, and his whole focus is actually on, um, on, on holding on to the truth. And he makes comparisons. For example, chapter 11 is that beautiful chapter about the heroes of the faith. And uh, after he's listed them uh, and spoke about them to the point where he says, I'm running out of space. I, I don't have time or space to even talk about. And then he, he goes along, gives a long list of, of people in the Old Testament who, who served God by faith. Then he says in chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Again, the encouragement to stand up, to stand fast. And we have all of these Old Testament witnesses uh, who encourage us to, to go on and to live for God. In chapter 13, um, very practical. He, uh, as I said, the latter part of the book is really very practical. He says, Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers. Uh, and then marriage should be honored in verse 4. Uh, some practical guidelines. Remember your leaders. Um, and, and, uh, and then as he comes to the end uh, in chapter 13, verse 20, he says, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good, for doing His will, and may He work in us what is pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he's got some um, concluding words and references. This is the only place where it sort of half smells like Paul, if you wish. He says uh, in verse 23, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Now, this is the only place where one could have an argument about Pauline authorship. As for the rest of the book, it doesn't look and smell or feel like the Apostle Paul. And I would still conclude that we simply just don't know who actually wrote this letter. Some of the highlights from the book of Hebrews. Jesus is the final revelation of God. Uh, we've looked at that even by way of a short devotion at the, at the start. Jesus is the great high priest. He is our high priest. And uh, it's, it's, it's based on this in particular and, and a few other references in Peter and so on in the New Testament where we believe what we call the priesthood of all believers. In other words, you and I as believers, as Christians, have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. We don't need another mediator. We, you don't need me or a pastor to intercede for you because you're a priest in your own right under Jesus Christ. If you know Christ, you can go to Him uh, and through Him to God. Uh, there is one of those contentious, very difficult passages in Hebrews chapter, 11, uh, chapter 5, verse 11, where Paul, I call it the falling away uh, passage, uh, and I'm saying, Paul, this, this is my slip of the tongue, where the author is saying, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. And then he says in chapter 6, verse 4, that's a whole section. I'll just jump forward to uh, verse 4 of chapter 6. 
It's impos impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance, because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. There's a similar reference also in chapter 10, and it had led to numerous discussions and debates around whether you can lose your salvation or not. Um, I, I personally believe in the assurance of salvation, but here is a very difficult passage, and you have to uh, deal with that if you if you're around uh, if you if you're uh, arguing on that particular uh, issue. Draw near to God. There's a there's a beautiful passage about serving God together, and don't neglect the gathering of of the church, which is one of the passages we use for. Uh, joining a church and, and joining the fellowship of believers and not neglecting that. The heroes of the faith I mentioned before, and then I started reading the perseverance and running the race, a passage in chapter 12. The message of Hebrew, Hebrews, the author makes it clear that the gospel fulfilled and superseded the Old Testament. Uh, there, there is no doubt in my mind that that is his approach, uh, that he is saying Jesus came, he fulfilled what God intended to do. And what was in the Old Testament, he, the author, calls it a shadow. It's merely a, a, a reflection of the reality. The reality is what Christ brought. And, and Jesus went into that real tabernacle, the real temple, when he went into heaven with his own blood as a sacrifice. And, uh, and therefore, Jesus came to fulfill everything that God wanted to do. And in the light of God's final revelation in Christ, Christians are exhorted to stand firm. That standing firm concept you will find as you read through Hebrews, you'll find it again and again highlighted. What's uh, the relevancy of Hebrews for us? Well, I believe in a time especially where pluralism is gaining popularity, the person and the work of Jesus Christ as unique and as the only way uh, the, the author highlights over here. In fact, he's not the only one, but certainly from the book of Hebrews, it's one thing that we cannot deny. Um, there are many who would like for us to believe that there are plenty of ways of getting to God. We really should just leave the, the Buddhists and the Muslims and all those because we're all okay. Ultimately, we'll get to heaven somehow or the other. Now, when you read Hebrews, it, it, makes, it makes nonsense of Jesus' sacrifice of death. Why did he die? If there, if there are other ways of getting to God, then Jesus died for nothing. Uh, that, in, in my opinion, would be the biggest argument for uh, reasoning for or arguing for the uniqueness of, the, of Jesus, the Son of God. The exhortation to stand firm is as relevant today as it has ever been. Uh, there's so, so many temptations and teachings, uh, false doctrines, and it's, it's holding on to the truth. Uh, and standing firm in the, in, the, um, in the face of temptations that really will keep us going. And then the heroes of the faith. It always makes for good reading when you go back to the Old Testament and you read how Moses stood firm and, and Abraham offered um, and sacrificed Isaac and, and all those heroes of the faith. And we, we can learn so much from them. And they didn't even have Jesus. We have Jesus. We have the Bible. We have the Christian church to support us. And so in a certain sense, we have even less of an excuse uh, not to stand firm. Now, that brings us to the book of James, the last one we're going to study today. And I just call it Practical Christianity. Uh, it is a really a practical book. Um, by way of introduction, it, uh, the letter has served as a real encouragement to many Christians around the world and over many centuries. Uh, it has not always been accepted into the canon. Um, maybe I should say it, there have been arguments around whether James should be in the canon. Uh, as late as Martin Luther, for example, it, it is in the canon, it was in the canon then, but Martin Luther didn't like it because when he made a comparison between James's approach to faith and works, and he looked at Paul in Romans, which was Romans is the book that really led Martin Luther to his conversion and, and uh, believing in God or in Jesus Christ and in, in justification by faith and by faith alone. He then read James and, uh, of course, James says, uh, you need to prove your faith uh, 
you need to show me your works. Uh, and, and they both use the exact same argument, and that is Abraham. And Paul says, Abraham was justified because he believed in God. Therefore, he sacrificed Isaac. James says, it is because he, he sacrificed Isaac, it, that proves that he believed in God. And so, Martin Luther didn't like that, and he said he called it the letter of straw. Um, and this is the picture of uh, Martin Luther uh, in the background, but um, I'm, I'm not going to go into all of that, but there have been arguments in church history about the inclusion of James. I think primarily because it was misunderstood. And maybe even today some people misunderstand James. James is a very, very interesting book. James is not one of those like, like Pauline letters where there, there's an argument. It's almost like a Greek philosophical argument from point A all the way to point uh, whatever it is, Z or, or whatever. Uh, James is far more um, Hebraic, uh, using almost an, uh, a Hebrew sort of uh, way of speaking. And uh, we'll, we'll be looking at that. And, and I think because of that and because of the practicality of the book, um, some people have thought perhaps the book should not belong in the canon. But in my opinion, there's no doubt it is in the canon. It has been accepted by the church. And um, I have no problem in accepting that. Now, the story that I referred to earlier on, we find in James chapter 2 in verse 20. And this is the way he says it. You foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Now, it's what he did, what he's done. That is where Martin Luther had his hair stand on end. He, could, he couldn't, just couldn't accept that because that was just way too much for him. Now, of course... I, I think the, the, there's a misunderstanding, I think, on the part of Martin Luther and others who, who wouldn't want to include this. And that is that Paul was correct by saying, if you believe in God, then you are justified. Your faith in Christ is what justifies you. But James was saying, there are too many people who say, well, I believe in God, but they don't live that way. And he said, and that's his argument over here, show me. If you say you believe in God, let, let me watch your life. It's but b by what you do that I can come to the conclusion. I mean, you can tell me a hundred times you believe in Christ, but if your life says differently or speaks a different language, then you're lying. Um, and he uses actually the example of the devil. He says, even the devil believes in God. Of course he believes in God. You can't deny that God exists. Uh, but the devil is certainly not justified. He's certainly not an angel. Uh, he doesn't live right. In fact, quite the opposite. And so James was simply arguing, if you believe in God, you need to show it with your works. Your works will confirm the fact that you believe in God. Whereas Paul, against the background of people who wanted to do um, circumcision and keep the law so that they can get to God, uh, Paul was arguing, those things will never bring you to God, ever. You need to believe, you need to put your faith and your trust in God, in Jesus, and it's by believing in Christ that righteousness is given to you. It's a free gift by God's grace. And so that was Paul's argument. And so the two are essentially saying the same thing, but coming to it from different angles. When it comes to the author of the book of James, you will note, notice that it starts by saying, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Uh, greetings. Now, that is your typical letter um, sort of approach, no problem. But who is the James? There are at least five Jameses in the New Testament. There is James the Apostle, who was the brother of John the Apostle, the two of them. Then there was another Apostle, James the son of Alphaeus. We read about him in Matthew 10, 3. Then James, a son or the son of Mary, um, it seems to be a different James. There was also a James who was the father of the other one of the disciples called Judas, not Judas Iscariot, another one. There, there was another Judas, and his father had, a, had the name James. And then there was a sibling brother of Jesus, James. Now, 
at some point in time we have already talked about this, that the James the Apostle, one of the twelve, was murdered by Herod fairly early on. And therefore, um, this happened literally just a few years or a year or two after the ascension of Jesus, by which time they haven't started writing letters or anything yet, it seems like. So he would have been too early to be the person um, that is writing the letter. When it comes to all of the other Jameses, they are relatively unknown. They don't feature either in the Bible much or in early church tradition. The one James that does feature very strongly is the brother, the sibling of Jesus. And we've talked about him when we talked about Paul. It was when Paul went up to Jerusalem, by which time the, the apostle James was long dead. And he still says, he still talks about Peter and James, the brother of Jesus who was regarded. Uh, those two were regarded as leaders in the church in Jerusalem. And so our conclusion is that he is the most likely candidate, if you wish, for, ha for having written the letter uh, that, we, that we have in our Bible. We learn more about him in Matthew 13, 55, Mark chapter 6, verse 3, and we can assume that he was included in Jesus' family in Mark chapter 3, 21, as well as in John 7, 3 to 5. Not always a positive picture. There are times when the brothers are directly opposed to Jesus. They, they ridicule him. At one stage, they thought he's lost his mind, even his mother. And they were standing outside the crowd uh, calling for him, and they want to take him home because he's now gone completely bonkers, they said. And so it's not always a, 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 a pretty picture in terms of the siblings of Jesus, the brothers, and, and we have no record of his conversion. So where in the ministry of Jesus, or after his death and resurrection, this James became a Christian, we actually don't know. But it's a very strong uh, early church tradition, and Paul mentions this James, as one who became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And uh, so he is probably the person who wrote this letter. And we need to read that as part of the background, therefore. When it comes to the date, according to an ancient tradition, James, the brother of Jesus, died in uh, 62. In other words, the author of the letter. So it must be before that time that he wrote this letter for determining the date we must also look at the recipients, and um, they are mentioned as the, Christ, uh, as the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. It's an interesting Hebrew concept. We have talked about the dispersion, the Jewish uh, diaspora or diaspora. We've talked about that before. Jews were scattered around the world. The 12 tribes literally were scattered. They started scattering um, basically for all the years, but in 722, when Samaria fell, the northern kingdom, those Jews scattered around the world. They never really came back in bulk. Many of them may have wandered back to Palestine, but, but we don't know about that. So they were scattered. From that point on, with the Babylonian exile, in the preparation for the coming of Jesus, during the, the time of the Greeks and the Syrians and the Egyptians, Jews scattered all over. So the concept of diaspora or being scattered or dispersion was a well-known one among Jews. Seems like James is taking the concept and giving it Christian, a Christian connotation, and that is the people who were scattered probably as a result of the persecution that broke out in Acts chapter 8. Uh, the, uh, the, there was the murder of Stephen, um, and let me just get to chapter 8. Um, and it says, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Is that word again, scattered. And godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. And then we have the story of Paul uh, following on from there. But, but it seems like on, on that occasion, in fact, it says in chapter uh, 8, verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And then Philip went to Samaria and so forth. Um, it seems like James is using the same concept of the Jews scattered around the world. Now the Christians are scattered around the world. Many of those were Jews. In fact, here in Acts chapter 8, they were Jews. Um, because by now, by, th by that time, uh, they haven't really started with a major mission among the Gentiles. That would only come in chapter 10 and then much later in chapter 11 uh, and, and Paul and others. So closer date then, somewhere between 40 uh, 
and 60. My personal opinion, probably around 50, as close as we will get, 50 AD, when James wrote this letter. And my personal belief is that, that James actually addressed these very same Christians who were scattered from Jerusalem. The, the strong Jewish background to the letter, some of the, the uh, Hebrew or Aramaic type features, literary features that we find in the book and so on, all indicate to me that you have a Jewish audience or recipient uh, audience, and, and the Jews would have been very familiar with the term uh, being scattered. Uh, the Greeks or the non-Jews, well, they were living where they were living. They were not necessarily scattered. And so I believe that um, those early Christians in Jerusalem who were scattered as a result of the persecution of Stephen uh, or, or the murder of Stephen in the persecution of the early church, that, that James was writing to them to give them some practical guidelines how to be Christian. Up to that point in time, they were mainly focused on Jerusalem. And yeah, they were, they were now a crowd of 5,000, maybe six, 7,000 people. They were relatively comfortable. They were part of one single church. They had the apostles to give them guidance. But the moment they scattered, hundreds, maybe thousands of them scattered all over, they were now planting churches. But how do you run churches? The, the apostles are all in Jerusalem. So I believe James picked up his pen and he wrote some guidance to them. So it's a sort of a circular to Christians who were being persecuted and who have now established churches in different places around the country and maybe even around the world. That would tell us something about the purpose of James in writing, uh, helping uh, Christians who have found faith and now scattered and they needed some guide, guidance and, and guidelines in terms of how to live. I've said this already, but there are several Jewish or Hebraic references, expressions and literary devices and they all suggest a readership that was familiar with either Judaism or even with Aramaic as a language. Um, and so those things come through uh, very clearly. Old Testament metaphors and references and other things. When we look at an outline of James, chapter 1 uh, is simply an introduction, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 2 to 18, we have trials and temptations. I think most of us are fairly familiar uh, with James talking about the persecutions and the trials that we will endure. Consider, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Then he goes on to talk about wisdom. If you lack wisdom, you need to pray about that. And wisdom is a concept that we'll pick up also in a moment, but it's one of the concepts uh, that you find in the book of James. And then faith in practice. He says in, in chapter 1 verse 19, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Again, the emphasis here is on practical living. How do you live out your faith? Uh, and he says you can do that by being slow uh, in speaking, quick to listen. And so it's very, very practical. And then do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourself, but, but practice the word. Again, the emphasis is on practical living. Um, in chapter 3, we have uh, a section that probably most of us know well, and that's about the tongue and the danger of the tongue. Very practical. Uh, James is very practical in speaking about uh, the, the way that we need to speak in, uh, and use our tongue when we speak. Um, wisdom and submission. Trusting in God, we find in chapter 4, verse 13, uh, when we do our planning, when we, when we deal with our, our wealth or our riches or our possessions. And then he also talks about suffering. And then we have a passage in chapter 5, verse 13. Uh, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him. And then he talks about conditions of praying over the sick. You go through the book of James, you will find James does not have any philosophical and major theological arguments. Uh, that is not his approach. His approach is a very practical one. Here are guidelines how you should live on a daily basis, how you should live out your faith on a daily basis. Um, and, and if you're looking for one single long argument in the book, you're going to look for nothing. 
um, because he doesn't have it. He shifts from one theme to another theme, uh, almost looking as if there's no link between them. Obviously, the, the whole book holds together, uh, but um, there, there is no one single theological argument in the book. It's, fear, it's, it's very, very practical uh, in its approach. And therefore, one can talk about some of the themes that you find in James, the response to trials, the hearing and the doing, partiality in the church. Um, I mentioned this earlier on, but James talks about the fact that we should not favor certain levels of society. He, um, in chapter 2, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. And he says, if a man comes in and he wears gold and he seems to be rich, you put him in the front. And if a person looks poor, you put him in the back. He says, it shouldn't be like that. You should treat everybody the same. And that obviously, again, we can read in, against the background of rich and poor or owners and slaves. And, and essentially, in Christ, we're at the same level and we shouldn't um, show favoritism. The danger of the tongue, the true wisdom, uh, sin that disturbs our relationship with God, uh, true and fervent prayer, um, the concept of prayer, which we find in chapter 5 we have looked at uh, a little bit. When it comes to James, uh, I said we'll look at one of the concepts that we find, and that is wisdom. Wisdom literature was a well-known form of literary art uh, in those days, especially in the Old Testament and in the ancient world and the ancient Near East. And uh, two things, prophecy and wisdom, both we, of those we find in the Old Testament. And actually in James, we have a sample of both of those. We have prophecy where James uses the prophetic voice, where he reprimands his, his readers. He, he sometimes uses very direct language. I mean, just listen to this in, in chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Now, that sounds like the prophet in the Old Testament, direct reprimanding the nation. But then we also have samples of wisdom. Uh, and several times he talks about wisdom. Uh, and in chapter 3, verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life. Again, James is very practical. Wisdom is not being clever. Wisdom is living right. That's what a wise person should do. And uh, we, we find in both prophecy and wisdom in James, we find uh, a lot of correspondence with Old Testament prophecy and wisdom literature. There's an interesting study um, around Jesus and James. Uh, now, of course, if it is, which I believe it was, James, the brother, the sibling of Jesus, it would be very interesting because the two of them would have grown up together, at least um, in some way, uh, because Jesus would have been the eldest, and how old James was, we, we don't know. But they would have grown up, they would share a similar tradition, similar training, uh, introduction to the synagogue, the law, and all of, all of those kind of things. And then Jesus would go off and ha have his ministry. And then sometime later, James became a Christian and now a follower of Jesus. It's interesting how he introduces himself um, as, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is quite interesting because here you have a sibling growing up with his brother, but he's now calling his, his older brother, he's calling him uh, um, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, I'm a servant of him. So there's obviously somewhere a major conversion or a switch in his mind in terms of who this brother of him was. But many scholars have pointed out to the similarities between James and several sections in James, and for example, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which we find in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where if you can look at the verses later on, but hearing the word of God, which both of them emphasize, the fruit of righteousness, the worry about the future, uh, all of those you find in James, but also uh, you find in the Sermon on the Mount. And there obviously would be a shared knowledge and a tradition uh, from the synagogue, from the Old Testament, from uh, Aramaic expressions, uh, and so on. And, and also, uh, maybe the two of them, as they were growing up, they shared similar language and style and literary devices, uh, and so on. Some of the passages that I encourage you to read in the book of James, uh, the joy in trials, uh, it's, it's not the kind of language I like, but James says, 
consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. It's not my normal response when there are trials in my life. I can guarantee you that. But there it is. This is what James is saying. And then if we lack wisdom, we should ask God for wisdom. He says in chapter 1, verse 5, the dangers of the tongue, the practical wisdom. Wisdom, as I said earlier, is not being clever. It's not knowledge. The wisdom is living right. And uh, this is what he's saying basically uh, in that section in chapter 3. Prayer for healing. And then the re relevancy of James. Well, I think it's precisely uh, in the practical aspects of James that he becomes very relevant for our daily living. What are the trials that you and I are facing? I, I don't know about you, um, but there are trials that we face on an ongoing basis, whether it's at work or in our families or our friends or relationships. There are trials. What are the trials that we face? How do we approach those trials? And then James highlights the contrast between rich and poor. How do we respond to that? Wherever you fit into that social strata or stratum uh, in, in our society, how do, you, how do you approach people above and below you from a Christian uh, perspective? We've looked at, at uh, Paul in, in Philemon, or to Philemon. And then the tongue problem is a, is a very, very relevant one. And we all suffer from that, speaking too much. And how do churches apply James's guidelines regarding prayer for the sick? When last have you seen that happen? Do we even apply that? Do the sick request the elders to come and pray for them? Or does it happen in public and, um, and so on? So those are some of the questions. I'd, I'm not giving you answers, but those are some of the issues that we are facing in the book of James. By way of summary, Philemon, we're talking about social structures, and those need to be changed from within. Change the heart of Philemon, and you change slavery ultimately. That, I think, was Paul's approach. Hebrews, Jesus came to complete, to fulfill, and to supersede the Old Testament, the law, and all of its requirements. It is in Jesus that we have final salvation. And James, the Christian faith affects every aspect of our daily living. Um, there is no such a thing as a Christian on a Sunday and during the week I do what I like. I'm a Christian every single moment of every day. Sunday is just a highlight in terms of corporate worship, but I worship as I go. And I think that's the point that James is making. Now next week we'll look at the rest of the general letters, Peter, John, and Jude, before uh, we get to the book of Revelation. May the Lord bless you and enjoy your week.